Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to the series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through three old school RPGs that have just tons of great ideas that either you can steal or just play straight up. These are all great systems. Uh, they're all, you know, firmly in the OSR, but there are different versions of the OSR, right? There's uh, the first one I'm going to be covering is Swords and Wizardry Revised, which is just an old school clone in a lot of ways with some, you know, variations and some some modifications. But it's, it's what we've seen elsewhere in a lot of ways with a different presentation. I'm looking at the Black Hack 2nd Edition, which is a very different take on old school games. And then I'm going to be looking at the White Box, W-I-G-H-T, the White Box. These are, uh, this is something I just ran into the other day. It was suggested on my channel uh, in one of the comments. And I checked it out and I immediately was drawn into it. Immediately. The presentation of this is excellent, so I, I can't wait to get to this one. But all three of these are complete games with um, you know, some, some uh, touchstones to things that we've seen before and elsewhere. So I'm going to start with Swords and Wizardry and just to give you guys a quick flip through and, and give you a sense of what's in this book. Now again, how, how much do you necessarily need another, you know, uh, old school revamp or, you know, the original game presented again? Uh, it depends. But if you are playing that game, right, that old original game either in one of its clones or in some variation on them, and you haven't looked at this one, then you should because if you like that rule set and it's something that appeals to you, then maybe this particular variation of it is something that you might want to check out. If you haven't played it, well then this is a very good, in my view, presentation of these old school rules. Um, this is short, and that's one of the notes here by Matt Finch. This is short compared to the multi-page rule libraries required to play most modern role-playing games. That's definitely true. This whole document is only 146 pages, and it includes everything you need to play the game. You can see from the character sheet the kind of game you're going to get. I like looking at a character sheet, and I'm glad that they include it right away because it gives you the sense of what kind of game you're going to play. The art on the sheet is awesome. I love it when sheets do that. They don't just not just a blank page. Um, you get a, a, a vibe and a tone. You print this off and give it to your players, or you use it online. And they're going to immediately, every time they look at the character sheet, they're going to be drawn back to the kind of game that it is, just in terms of the art presentation. I think that's great. Class, alignment, age, ancestry, and deity, experience points, prime attribute, XP bonus, hit points, your saving throw, and your armor class. And you have class abilities along with your attribute bonuses. So, you know, this is one of those old school games where it's not a set thing that your ability gives you. So strength isn't just a plus whatever to the different things that strength are associated with but it gives you a certain bonus to hit and a certain bonus to open doors and a certain damage bonus and a certain carry modifier. And the same thing with a dex score, right? It's going to have a certain bonus to missiles, a certain armor bonus, and then constitution is going to have a raise dead survival check if, you're, if someone casts raise dead on you and the hit point bonus that it's going to give you. Uh, and then intelligence gives you additional languages, charisma gives you number more max hirelings. Uh, then the second page for all the extra stuff with thieving skills and you can say it's going to be percent based thief skills which is, you know, what we see in those old school games. Getting started, this is really clear, and I think that's one of the things that I like, I appreciate so much about this book, the Swords and Wizardry revised version, is that it just gives you everything super clearly as you go through. Step by step, you don't have to really hunt around to figure out how to use these old school rules. And then the presentation of the class is excellent. The art is good, very clearly what they're about, their alignment, and then, you know, the basic information you're going to need to play them. Their skills, their abilities, uh, their, their XP required to level up, their hit dice, and saving throws. Clerics, same deal. And druids, fighters, magic users, monks, paladins, rangers, thieves. And then you get your alignment and your ancestry. So this assumes... Um, this assumes... Race as class, sorry, not, not race as class. This is race and class are separate. So that's what you're going to be doing. You're going to be picking a class, and then some classes are, are ancestry locked. So clerics, for example, can only be half elves or humans. Um, but, but, you know, they're, they're separate. You don't just pick an elf, you don't just pick a dwarf. You pick a, you know, a fighter, and then you pick your race. You pick a thief, and you pick your, your ancestry, I should say, as this game calls it. Choose an alignment. And some brief introduction, in, I shouldn't say brief, uh, a couple paragraphs about what law, chaos, or neutrality are, and why you might pick one or the other. And I think that's interesting. Again, I like games that tend to do the law, neutrality, chaos, rather than good and evil. 
an adding good and evil in there. I know it's more precise, but I find that if my players... Alignment is one of those things that for a while my players got super hung up on. And I don't know what, whether it was like 3rd edition, 4th edition, 5th, I don't know what, what it was. But alignment became like a big deal. And the discussions about alignment and what alignment meant and all that stuff. And I found that as I've moved away from 5e, alignment has become less important in one sense. Every player plays a good or neutral character pretty much in terms of their, you know, their good, neutral, evil axis. They're, they're, they're almost always playing good or neutral characters. I don't really allow evil characters at my table. I've never seen it done well. None of my players like it very much. So I don't do evil characters. Which means that that's just off the table, which means really you're talking about the difference between ultimately law and chaos. Or sorry, law and neutrality, <laughs> really. This is it someone who's really orderly and structured, or is it someone who's much more for themselves? It's kind of how I see it. And I know that's not necessarily how everybody sees it. And I don't want to start an argument about alignment. For sure, because it just goes nowhere, as I remember from the third edition days. But... I like systems that just do more lawful, neutral, chaotic. You know, you just pick a kind of cosmic force if you're going to align yourself to it. And then other than that, you kind of just play a character rather than playing an alignment. I found that to be super boring when I was playing it before uh, in old editions. Uh, choose a character ancestry. Dwarves, elves, half-elves, halflings, and humans. Those are the basic, um, the basic ancestors you can play in this game. How to buy equipment. It's interesting that they do um, decimal points for gold pieces right so if it's in the tens category you're looking at silver if it's in the hundreds category it's it's copper but um everything's just given in terms of gold pieces i can see why that might be useful on the other hand um i don't know why they don't just use silver and copper in fact i'm not sure why we don't just use a silver base for most of these games anyway uh, i know that you know finding piles of gold pieces is cool but Silver as a, well, again, maybe this just comes back to realism versus gameism, but I find that silver as a base for your economic system, silver pennies, is way more realistic, and it keeps that, I don't know, it keeps the finding of gold piles much more interesting when you find them. Uh, weapons and armor, uh, armor class and calculating armor class. Right, you're looking at these descending armor classes here, and but there are alternate rules for how to use... Uh, Ascending armor class, if you'd like, and it's not too hard to do, right? There's just a bracket for the ascending value. Excuse me. Weight and movement, and how that works. Uh, base speed, outdoor speed, movement rate, and then how to play. Again, very, very quick in terms of how quickly it goes into things. Now, categories of saving throws are... I'm not sure I, per I like this particular version of the old school vision for saving throws. You simply have levels and, uh, you know... Your, your saving throw is tied to it, so um, it's an adaptation of the original, which had several different risks instead of a single base saving throw as used here. The original version of the following categories and target numbers. And so you can you can convert if you want, but the table doesn't, uh, as, it, as it says here, the table does not integrate directly into swords and wizardry. So you have to, you'd have to do that on your own manually. Otherwise, the saving throws are just base. Um, a successful saving throw means that you, the character, or the monster avoids the threat unless each time a char each, char each character class is a saving throw target number, which gets lower and lower. And then as you, just to save, you have to roll under that. And that's class-based. So your class has a saving throw level. And it goes down, and that's it. And, and I find that to be really not my favorite. Just having a set saving throw for every kind of save doesn't, doesn't work for me. And, um, yeah, so that's one criticism I would have of this version of the game. I don't I don't particularly like that that view of it. Um, now, it does say that some character classes have better than average chances to make a saving throw against particular types of hazards. So the wizard magic users get a plus two bonus to the die roll for their saving throws against spells of all kinds. So ultimately, they're still trying to include multiple kinds of categories. It's just um, you have to do it more as an ad hoc basis. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> not, not, not a fan of that so much. Initiative is what we see in old school games. Check for surprise, declare spells, then determine initiative. Movement, missile fire, combat, uh, melee combat and spells, and then the round is complete. So you get that process of going through, as you see in other old school games. There are alternate ways given of doing all of these combat sequences with the core rule system, alternate combat system from the Holmes Blue Book set, and then the modified supplement three rules. So one of the things that this, this really does is it looks at not just one version of the old school rules of the old set, the 70s and 80s but it says okay here are several things that were done back then pick the one that works for you right because 
in early D&D, people were experimenting. They were trying new things. They were shifting between them. Uh, they weren't super consistent with one set of rules that just ran through every table back then. And so I really appreciate that this book does that. It, it, or, it references that. It gives you many different options and says, hey, here's what people used to play. You know, if you're, if you're going for the old school revival, if, the, if that's what the R means for you, right? <laughs> revival. Well, then what are you reviving? Well, here are lots of different things you can revive. I like that too. Uh, attack tables, as you uh, as you expect in an old school game. Lots and lots of tables for attacking and defending. Uh, and then you get specific situations which might give you optional rules and change some things about your about your combat role. Turning on dead tables, and then a gameplay example, which is very clear, and I like it a lot. Uh, and it divides it up. Here's one of the things I, I really like about it. Has a regular, you know, run through the basic a process of play, then trouble develops section, so what's happening when troubles are, and then traps and loot, and how that is to be run. So it's, it's good that it has a breakdown of each of these kinds of things. With high-level adventuring and stronghold rules, a great castle image here, with uh, its structural points and uh, what kind of thing you're looking at here. Followers, magic. Now, here's one thing that I might find uh, to criticize this book, and, and this, is, this is a matter of taste rather than a matter of uh, proficiency or something like that. And that's just the, the sheer amount of writing at times. That like this section on magic is, in my opinion, much too long. There's no reason to give these many paragraphs on what magic is in an old school game. You know, I'd say a paragraph and then jumping right into it is fine. Not that the writing is bad, the writing is good, but it is just a lot. And, and again, if the, if the idea is to recreate, revise, represent the old school rules. I can see why you might bring in a lot of this stuff, but you know, there, there's there's a limit to, you know, it, it's not that bad. It's a page, right? A, a, two, a two column uh, page. It's, it's not like, you know, pages and pages and pages, but I just think that that's one thing this book does at times is it, it, it over explains things just a little bit uh, in a few paragraphs and when, when one would suffice. Not often, but, but sometimes. Um, the number of spells in here is great and you get a whole bunch of spells for old school games. Uh, mostly they are what we've seen in other books, but they are, you know, you can certainly approach them as you, uh, you know, take this version of a spell instead of one from one of the other old school games. <laughs> Great piece of art there. Um, I think that dwarf's arm is just melting off. Um, yeah, I think it's totally melted off already. Uh, the rules are just guidelines. There's not a rule for everything. When in doubt, make a ruling. Yeah, that's good advice. Designing a dungeon adventure with a really cool sample dungeon map. I love this one. I wish they I wish they keyed the entire dungeon instead of just the first few rooms because I think that actually could be a really cool dungeon. Um, but, you know, there's a few in there that are given to you with lots of tables for generating your own and more art that I like. Wilderness adventures and rules for that. Random castles you can run into, which is always good to have. Magic users, clerics, special combat rules outside. And then you get into uh, a referee session log. Then you get a whole section on monster descriptions. And this is where I think I like this book the most, is the monster descriptions. They're punchy and short, as I prefer. Now, you're, you're going to see a lot of the same creatures that you see in other old school games, but it's a particular take on them. And one of the things that I did was I went through and I looked at all these different old school games recently, and I checked the owlbear to see how the Owlbear compares in each in each edition. Um, unsurprisingly, 4th edition D&D had the strongest Owlbear that I could find. At least it's not surprising to me. 5th edition D&D's Owlbear was actually quite strong too, although relative to the players, it's not super strong. But these old school games have a very similar Owlbear. It's almost always doing the same thing. Um, sometimes it gets a screech, sometimes it doesn't get a screech, sometimes it has an extra speed when it's attacking, sometimes it doesn't. Um, Pathfinder had a really cool variant on the owlbear, which is like this silent knight, or like, you know, owl, owlbear that, that glides through the air silently, and it strikes you from above. That's kind of cool. Um, so you can look at the different owlbears in the different editions if you want a quick overview. <laughs> but this one, I think, is a pretty good one. Monsters by challenge level, always useful to have. And then a creating monster table, very good too, right? That's one thing that 5th edition D&D doesn't do terribly well, is show you how to make your own monsters quickly. It doesn't say, you know, there certainly are rules for it. Um, I don't remember if they're in the monster manual or the DM's guide. I think they're in the DM's guide. But it's um, it's not too 
I mean, it's, it's not too hard to do, but they don't give you any, you know, real advice for it easily or quickly early on. Uh, I like that this says you uh, how to create your own monsters. Magic items. Great, unique magic items with uh, unusual weapon descriptions, which is great. I like it. <laughs> I like that. And these will armor different kinds of magic items as you go through, and then of miscellaneous magic items, particular ones, right? So the amulet against scrying, the, the uh, deck of many things, the hell of fiery brilliance, and then cursed items. That's Swords and Wizardry by Mythmere Games. Um, great quotes from <laughs> Led Zeppelin. Great, great quote, Led Zeppelin on the back. So Swords and Wizardry Revised is, I would say, a very proficient, um, pretty punchy, although with one or two exceptions, you know, a couple occasions where the writing is a little bit too long for what uh, it's trying to do, which I think is be much more concise and much clearer and just get to the point um, than a lot of other old school games can, can do. I've seen other 146 page documents, 150 page documents that do not include as much as this book does that aren't as clear as this book is in terms of old school design. A lot of small, smaller games that are trying to be really, really, really faithful to the old way of playing or trying to present their own version. This one is great. Also, I really appreciate that it at times gives you variants and says, hey, here's where they come from and here's you know, why you might use them. That's cool. Uh, rather than just saying, here's the way to play it with maybe an option here or there, I always appreciate it when variants are given and then maybe a little explained or like what this might do to your table. That's cool. I like that a lot or where it came from. So Swords and Wizardry, I highly recommend you check it out at the very least, uh, if you haven't already. And I'm sure a lot of you already have. The second one I wanted to cover is the Black Hack. This is very different in terms of its, in terms of its presentation, in terms of its mechanics, what it's doing in the old school scene. Rules Light, old school fantasy role playing game, definitely it's by David Black. Um, <laughs> featuring a do-it-yourself homebrew of original era fantasy gaming and modern game design theory. And that's one of the interesting things that I see here. Is there's definitely modern game design infused into the black hack here. So it's a very different kind of OSR. But I think it fits into that very, very well. You have all the different sections laid out pretty easily. It's not hyperlinked, but that's okay. Playing the black hack rules for everyone and the rest of the um, things in the book. Uh, I really like this, and I think it is... Very, very clear. I'm not sure I would ever use this system for a couple of reasons, but there are tons and tons of great ideas in here and tons of great tables towards the end, which I think are really, really cool. Rules for everyone. Very uh, nice to lay this out right at the very beginning. Relative times, quick examples, the GM's turn, resolving actions, character actions and attributes, advantage and disadvantage, hit dice and hit points. So all of that stuff laid out very clearly early on. Abstract distances. Close, nearby, far away, and distant. We see that in a lot of games. We see it in, in um, well, we see it here first, but we saw it in uh, Shadow Dark as well. Creature movement, how to play with tokens, if you want to keep track ge of general uh, positioning and things like that. Relative distances and converting measurements if you really want a precise battle map or something like that. Close is five feet or a square, nearby is 30 feet or six squares, far away is 60 feet, and distant is beyond that. Here's a little mini battle map in terms of relative positioning. And then I like this marching order little tracker. Great to have that. Attacking, defending, damage, and initiative in the order of combat. Breakdown of all the rules there. Uh, armor values do not stack. That's an interesting thing there, right? So characters give uh, armor, gives player a pool of armor dice. It's a d6, and the number of the d6s in the pool is equal to the armor value. So if a character fails to defend, they can take one armor die out of the pool and put it aside and declare it broken. All damage from the attack is ignored. So basically, um, you, you're trying to block damage with your armor values. But if, if you fail to defend, right, or you take damage past it, you can just break your armor a little bit and and ignore all that damage. So it's sort of a combination of that shields will be broken or shields will be splintered rule that you see in old games, but it applies to all armor. I think that's really cool. Um, so you have to attack and then, you know, the defense is uh, is um, the role that you make. You make an attribute attack and then a, a defense attribute test to defend. Damage, large weapons, critical hits, uh, hindrances, as you might expect. It's a basic uh, system there. Now, out of action is a pretty, mm -hmm. I would say it's pretty lenient. So when you go to zero, when you're out of action, right? That's if you go to zero hit points, uh, you can no longer move or take actions. And then when you receive aid or when the danger passes, then you roll on the table. If you survive, which is one through five, you get hit points and are no longer out of action. But if you lose the fight or you're unable to recover the body, they're dead, uh, lost forever and presumed dead. And then you roll on that D out of action table. And yeah, bad stuff can happen, right? But 
one, two, and three are very short term. Four and five are more permanent. Charisma reduced by D4 or strength or dex is permanently reduced by two. Six is dead. So you have a 50% chance of something very bad happening to you, a one in six chance of something you know, just death being dead. Otherwise, you have a 50% chance of just having kind of a, um, you know, just a disadvantage on some stuff. Like that head is just a disadvantage on all tests for the next half hour of play, which I assume means meta, right? So the next half hour you guys are at the table, you have a disadvantage on all your tests. That's not that bad. And one is just knocked out. So it's pretty non-lethal, at least as far as I can tell here. Uh, damage location drop table. If you need to know where a creature has been hurt, that's cool. If you have this printed out, you can just roll it out. This is a table that I might, if you have like a play binder, right? Or like a, like a, or a, a book that you use at the table. This is one I might print out and use and add to that book. Uh, levels and experience, how that works. Carousing table, which is great. It's a very small carousing table, but it's always good to have carousing tables. One of the things that this book uses primarily is usage dice. So you have a, every item has a usage, usage die. And when you use that item, you roll, and if you roll one or a two, then you just downgrade it to the next die in the chain. So if it is a usage die of a d10, you roll a d10. If you roll one or a two, then the die becomes a d8. And so you're basically running out of stuff right as you go down. And if you roll one or two on a d4, you're out. And so that's ammunition uses that, rations uses that, a lot of different items use that. Some players really like that abstract die. I thought I, thought I liked it. I mean, I did like it. <laughs> I tried to use it in my game. My players really didn't enjoy it. They, they much preferred having that concrete knowledge of how much how many resources they had left rather than the sort of abstract who knows how long. Like, I think it just depends on your table. How resting works and healing works. You know, this is all just the basic rule set, and they're, they're easy. You can see they're just on 15 pages, and you've got most 15 pages so far, and you've got most of the rules for the game that you'd need. Now you get page 16, you get creating a character. It's pretty easy. 3d6, roll them together. All of your attributes in order. If you roll 14+, plus, don't roll the dice for the next attribute. Instead, it will be a 7. It's a really interesting mechanic there. So if you get a 14 or higher, the next one is just simply 7. Again, some players are going to hate that. You roll really high, you get a good attribute and a bad attribute. Now, if you roll, it's interesting. If you roll a 14 for Charisma, or 14 plus for Charisma, then you just get that. There's nothing bad that happens after that. So, um, so yeah, if you have a high strength, you're, un you're unlikely to have you're likely to have a low dex. You know, actually, if you have a high strength, you're going to have a low dex. If you have a high constitution, you're going to have a low wisdom. If you have a high intelligence, you're going to have a low charisma. And if you have a high dex, you're going to have a low con. If you have a high wisdom, you're going to have a low intelligence. It's interesting, and I'm not sure every player is going to like that. I'm not sure every DM is going to like that. Um, you know, you can't have a high wisdom, high intelligence character to start. Or at least 14 plus wisdom and have anything better than a 7 in intelligence. So... Then you can swap two attributes. So in that sense, you could, right? You could say, uh, if you have a 14 wisdom, seven intelligence, and like a 14 charisma, you could swap the charisma and intelligence at the end. Then you choose your class. There's only four base classes, warrior, thief, cleric, and wizard, and you make a background. How to make a good background? And this is because it's, it's, it's broader, right? It's broader than simply um, just a D20 table with a name. You have to kind of come up with a background as a player that encapsulates an interesting time in the character's past and advantages are given to you based on your background. Then you get the classes. Very simple little character sheet here. Warrior and their starting stats, equipment, self-reliant, which is a power, uh, shield bash, dealer of death when you gain a new level. Thief, same deal. Cleric, same deal. Wizard, same deal. And then you get a bunch of spells for the different levels. So level one spells, you get charm, magic, missile, light, and shield. Sleep, you get, you know, level two spells, sleep, detect, magic, knock, lock, and web, etc. So you get a whole bunch of spells all the way up to level 10. Then you get cleric prayers all the way up to level 10. And then a generic character sheet, notes and maps. Players turn back. Now, from this point on, we're only 29 pages into the document. This is where this book gets really good and why I'd recommend checking it out if you haven't. This is where, beyond the rule stuff, this is where we start to get advice and tables. Really, really cool advice and tables. Now this is interesting, it's the, the number of hit dice that a creature should be dealing to a character when they hit them, right? So if it has 5 hit dice, it should be doing a d12 damage, or 6 flat. If it has 10 hit dice, it should be doing d10 plus d12, or 11 damage flat. Really cool. So you can have a base of just really quick at a glance how, how much damage should a creature be doing to a player in this game to have that balance. Now obviously you can unbalance it if you want, but that's the basic idea. 
A reaction table, which is more than just hostile morale, it's a D12, or rather a D11 mora a reaction table, or I guess 2D6, <laughs> right? Uh, but on a 2, they surrender or offer allegiance. On a 6, they wait for the PCs to act first. On a 7, they withdraw to a safer location. So it's a specific action done instead of just a generic, like, hostile or curious or something like that. Like, you actually get a specific one. Some player again, you, this, uh, the specificity there is, is going to be what some players, don't, some GMs don't like. But I think it's useful to have an actual specific reaction table that tells you what precisely this creature will do. Um, then there's morale rules, which I really like. Random encounters, what and why. And I like that. Why would you do a, rea a random encounter rule? Serve two major game purposes. First, to ensure the game will always offer unexpected situations. Secondly, they reinforce the fact that the world the characters belong in uh, exists beyond their own actions in it. That's cool. How to make an encounter roll and um, you know, nearby life, far by life. And then random undead, you might, or random encounters turn into undead, chaos, humanoid, draconic. Equipment, the usage die and how that works, haggling and how that works. Equipment list roll uh, tables. Retainers with their talents. Panic and light rules for panic, rules for light. Diseases, narcotic, and poisons with some great uh, diseases, narcotics, and poisons. Great tables to add into your game. Uh, for poisons here, ingredients, doses, and what the failed contest on it does. With the name, and the prefix, suffix, and preparation, so you can create your own, and the antidote to it. Different drugs that you can use in your game. Finding new spells, where you can find them, when it is a hero wizard will level up, with wizard names, titles, familiars, their parents, and their peculiar talents. Magic side effects, D100 magic side effects. Awesome. Uh, the inciting incident to a, an adventure or a campaign. Starting the first game, and how to a game in the old school fashion. Adventure must be found, the world is cruel and weird, the world is persistent, and the very first session is how, what you should do with that first session. Quick reference tools, NPC concept generators, great die drop tables, right? D4, D6, D8, D10, D12, you get a, ra a random NPC. NPC appearance with their random names and story hooks. How NPCs are related, again, the same thing, D4, D6, D8, D10, D12. You get all the different uh, connections between NPCs. With D100 activities, a die drop table for what's on the corpse. Overland Adventure. Hex Terrain Generator. D4, D6 again, die drop. Hex Feature Generator again, die drop. With an example hex map, which is great. I love the art on this one. The blank one as well. A Settlement Generator, the same thing. A drop table for what's in that generator or what's in that place. So you can see this is the part of the book that I really, really like. Tavern Generation. Sample Taverns. Quest Hook Generators. Rival Hero Generators. Drop table for the appearance of the NPC. Underworld Adventures. Dungeon Generator. Inhabitants generator, entrance generator, room area generator, empty room generators, uh, dungeon ambiences, architectural tricks, written tricks, natural hazards, magical hazards, traps, secret doors, blank tombs and lairs with uh, blank tables for that, blank dungeon, great dungeon map here if you want to use it for your game. Random map markers, and then monsters and every monster, right? There's a stat for every monster. If you just want to make a monster on the fly, here's how you do it with different categories. Spiteful, graceful, stubborn, striker, and slippery. Bloodthirsty, supportive, inspiring, armor, swarming, frenzied, pack tactics, hidden and sprightly. And then you might find things on every monster. And then there are particular monsters. So banished elves, black magic wizards, demons, uh, dire wildlife, dragons, dwarves, elementals, elven kind, floating oculuses, <laughs> giant kind, gnolls, goblin kind, humans, lizard folk, long dead future man, mushroom people, oozes and slimes, pig-faced orcmen, shades and horror, skeletons, spiderlings, telepathic gastropods, gastropoids, excuse me, toad men, trolls, vampires, void spawn, reanimated zombies, and the weirdo monster generator, part one, part, part A, part B, excuse me, and then more oddness. D12, 2D12 magic items, and then making better magic items, treasure hoards that you can find with a die drop table with a sample dungeon at the very end for you to include in your game and an appendix. So the Black Hack is awesome, especially with all of those random tables. Uh, Black Hack 2nd Edition. I think the game is cool. It's uh, really, really simple, really straightforward, 20, about 29, 30 pages for all the main rules you need, and then the GM section with a bunch of cool tables. So this is a great book to have. If you're interested in running a rules light -er, uh, old school game, then this is definitely on the list of things to check out. But I like those tables a lot, and I like how they're laid out. Really cool. And the art is flavorful and brings you right into it. And the last one I wanted to check out was the white box. W-I-G-H-T, white. I love this thing. Just, again, a simple perusal is all I've done of this so far. So this is going to be a bit more of a first, not a first time read through, but a first time detailed look through. Um, original Rules and Ideas by Gary Gygax, Dave Arneson, and Jeff Perrin. 
reinterpreted and compiled by the basic expert and the TBE and Associates uh, Gilded Server. This is a great book, really great. It's first little table of contents, uh, very useful and hyperlinked. So that's one of the things I like about this book. Great use of art. Some of it's public domain, some of it's uh, specific for this game. Really, really great. And there's a bit of an introduction here, but it's really, really, uh, I would say, um, self-deprecating, right? What you have done, what you have before you isn't anything born from my creativity. I, I don't know, I would argue against that, but this is a recompilation and a reinterpretation, and that's that second part, the reinterpretation of what Gary Gygax, Dave Arneson, and Jeff Perrin introduced, that I think is is why it's a bit self-deprecating. Um, the, the modesty is, is good, I mean, it's, it's appealing. I, I like that, you know, someone's like, hey, this isn't something super new and creative and crazy, but this is something that we've seen elsewhere, but in a new in a new form and Again, I think right now, it's totally free. It's not eventually going to be totally free. I think you have to maybe play for it once it's f finally done and all the editing's finished. But for now, at least, it's free, so you can check it out. Heroes and Magic and the ability scores that you get from their prime requisites. Race and Class, you get Clerics, Fighting Men, Magic Users, Dwarves, Elves, oops, and Halflings. Uh, how, what happens if a character dies? You have a relative and an alignment. Language, starting gold, and equipment. Really, really to the point, and like, I mean, it gets, it's punchy, right? This is really, really quick. Gets you right into it. Encumbrance, man-at-arms and hirelings, classes at higher levels, advancing in levels. I mean, you get, by the time you're on page 24, you're already just looking at hit dice, accumulation methods. <laughs> and then you get magic and sorcerer on page 25. So the basic rules, all the character stuff that's done very quickly, gets you right into it. Magical research and how that works, clerics versus undead with their tables. A spell list, you get the standard level 1 spells, level 2 spells, level 3 spells for wizards and clerics. Again, the basic stuff here, we're not looking at anything crazy new and, and, and creative. We're looking at a re-presentation of the old stuff, but it's all free. Again, for now. I'll put the note. Maybe it's pay what you want, actually, now that I think about it, I think it's pay what you want. But I'll put links below to where you can get it. The different saving throws, and again, we have the categories of saving throws in this version, instead of just the flat set one or the, or the saving throws based on ability scores. Great piece of art there for a castle. Adventures and how to lay them out, uh, how to lay out dungeons and things like that. And then it was a sample dungeon. Chance of monsters and treasure in the dungeon. I really like this. I really like just the way it's presented. Again, that public domain art and um, just the way that it, I don't know, uh, it really appeals to me. Dungeon expedition time. Doors in the dungeon, traps, light, wandering monster rules. I like, yeah, again, like this sort of art at the bottom there. Great, great art. Monster determination by dungeon level. And then the kind of monsters you might run into. Combat encounters. Combat is resolved in the following steps. Now, one thing is it would be nice to have these things on one page instead of two, right? So sometimes they're, they're divided, but this is a work in progress, so I would hope that would be maybe changed so that things are on one page as opposed to two. Combat sequence. Uh, you know, step one and step two are on this page. Step three, four, five, and six are on the next. It's not a big deal, but it would just be nice to have it all on one page. Um, but it's what we see elsewhere, right? Check for surprise, roll for initiative, any prepared spells that are uh, ready to be triggered in a resolve, missile fire, melee combat, and then morale checks. There's no movement, right? That's not uh, that's not a uh, an issue here. Then you have surprise, monster reactions, initiative, attack rolls, going through how that works with the attack matrix for each for each, each uh, class. I'm not interested in attack matrices in games that have them, but some tables love them. And so again, if you're interested in looking at a new version of that, here's one you can check out. Weapon classes, fighting capability, uh, charge attacks, morale, evasion and pursuit. Oh, I love that. I love that art right there. The piece of art. Wilderness adventures and how that works with a great uh, use of uh, you know hex map there. Very appealing to me. Getting lost in random encounters. Random encounters in the, in the wilderness you might run into. A note on other worlds. Battles in the air. <laughs> Move. Diving, climb, missile fire in the air, bombing, missile uh, combat in the air, naval combat, S uh, ship types, missile fire at sea, ramming, shearing oars, grappling, boarding, melee at sea and command. There's left lots of rules for lots of different kinds of combat. Castles and encountering castles. Castle construction. Jousting. An interesting rule for uh, how to joust. Set of rules if you're interested in, in jousting. Jousting. That's, not, that's something I've never seen in any in any old school game before, is a jousting set of rules. Maybe it's in the old set of rules. I haven't read through the, the original and all the supplements for all the original games, but 
Maybe it's in there, but I've never seen it in any of the revivals or the re revisions or anything like that. Kind of cool. Healing. Great piece of monster art there. Foes and fortune. How to read the stat blocks. Again, very punchy, short uh, creature descriptions with a lot of great art. Not art for every creature, but for many of them. And uh, I think it's great, very flavorful. The ghouls, that's a great piece of art for the ghoul. Uh, for the gnomes there, goblins. Hobgoblins, hydras, hippogriffs, horses, and mules. Kobolds, great standard creatures that we've run into before and elsewhere. That's a really great piece of art. Really horrifying. Leeches, specters, vampires, wyverns. How to do different things like custom monsters, large insects or animals, level drain. Treasure letter types, so based on the kinds of treasure. You can run into gems, jewelry, and other jewelry, other and other things. Magic items, cursed items, description of magic items. Again, nothing we haven't seen before, but still very, very good. Another great piece of art there. Magic swords and their different abilities. Magic armor. A weird piece of art there. With an appendix, appendix at the end for dungeon generation. And all that. Another appendix at the end for hex generation. For oracles. It's kind of interesting. And how to run them. Good advice for that, which not a lot of people often run into. Uh, NPC generation here. Room content generation here. A lot more. The thief. Right, here's the advanced table for the thief. Uh, pull it arm, pull arms galore, and then that's it. So uh, again, not anything terribly, terribly brand new, but it's another presentation of the rules with great use of public domain art, use great use of other art here, um, and uh, yeah, original art from the basic expert along with public domain illustrations. Great use of uh, of art throughout. A good presentation, clear presentation. There's some you know, modifications that need to be made. It's a work in progress, obviously, but you don't have to spend a bunch of money on it. Um, you can check it out, play test it, see how it works, and give feedback to the basic expert on how it's going. And I think you can do that for free. So anyway, here's the white box, the black hack second edition, and swords and wizardry complete the revised version. Hope this has been interesting, guys, and I'll see you in another video.